Welcome to Strictly Facts, a guide to Caribbean history and culture, hosted by me, Alexandria Miller. Strictly Facts teaches the history, politics, and activism of the Caribbean and connects these themes to contemporary music and popular culture. Well, I'll go on Strictly Facts fam. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. We've discussed so many times here um, how the Caribbean is really praised globally for our immense music culture. But beyond what some would regard as some of the widely known genres like reggaeton, dance hall, or even calypso, which we talked about in an earlier episode, there are so many more. And, you know, they really highlight our creative culture and indigenous histories and in embodied ways through movement. Our episode today is doing just that, amplifying yet another very important Caribbean music and dance style you may or may not have heard of, bomba. Joining me for this discussion today is Dr. Sarah Elizabeth Bruno. Dr. Bruno, thank you so much for joining us. Please tell us a bit about yourself, where in the Caribbean is near and dear to you, and what led you to studying bomba? Hey, I would say I decided to study bomba as a poet before I ever did as a grad student. I'm from the south side of Chicago. My family's from Puerto Rico, Chicago, and I think those are the places that are near and dear to me. I think pockets of Chicago, much like New York even, are parts of the Caribbean, you know, whether they're actually in the geographic space or not. Bomba for me, it's always been a space where I could seek out what I felt was missing in my Puerto Rican history classes as far as like Black Puerto Ricans. Um, I felt that there wasn't too much discussion on like feeling or even like everyday life. And as I realized through not even just my poetry, like meditations on it, but more later in grad school, I was able to think through and see the correlations between bomba and everyday Black life in Puerto Rico, how people survive, and what decolonization can look like on the ground, really. And not just through like armed insurgencies, but like the everyday practice of decolonizing what's important and who you learn from. And I think bomba holds so much in it. Um, and it gets overlooked a lot, mostly because of how it's framed within the Puerto Rican imaginary. But my hope is that I could, with the help of my elders, render some of it bare to folks. I think that's a very important part for us to start on. But I think before we dive too deep into it a little bit, could you walk us through some of the early origins of Bumba and especially touch on the sort of African and, and indigenous integral histories to the to the genre? Sure. I think um, there is this Puerto Rican theorist, Jose Luis Gonzalez, that says during a time in history when Puerto Rican theorists were trying to figure out what does it mean to be Puerto Rican? Like who gets to be the real Puerto Rican, right? A time when people in Puerto Rico were trying to distance themselves from this Spaniard identity um, and really cultivate their own type of culture. They're like, what is Puerto Rican culture? And during this time, um, this theorist in this uh, piece, this essay called El País de Cuatro Pisos, so the four-story country, basically, or nation, he says that the first Puerto Ricans were the enslaved Black Puerto Ricans dancing bomba on the outskirts of sugar plantations. And I, I don't think many people focused on that enough. And so for me, um, Bomba, if we take that seriously, like this is where Puerto Rico is beginning to take place, like shape itself into what it would be molded into as we know it today. Bomba started as a drumming tradition genre. I always call Bomba a genre because it includes drumming and dancing. I feel like they're both so integral to how we understand it. There is a principal drummer who follows the movements of the dancer who enters the dance circle or the bate as we call it. And then there are other drummers and, and anyone who makes up the circle and like the witnessing audience kind of like active observationist 
stands is also a part of the Bape. And so for me, um, in my studies, I did a, a year of field work, like official field work. I was able to talk to a lot of folks and everyone has their different understanding or takeaway of what Bomba used to look like. But now we see Bomba in this really folkloric skirt situation. Or you can see like more women dancing with banuelos or like scarves or without anything, dancing kind of like how men used to dance throughout history in Bomba. But in reality, now you see a lot of women in the bate um, as drummers, singers, and dancers. But back in the day, women didn't drum and women could enter the bate for sure, but they weren't known to be the main dancers men were. And bomba typically was like danced in partners back in the day. And so the men would be marked by the drum and the women were more like ornamental, but apparently women were always singing. And that's one instance of like how bomba might've looked like back in the day, but it, it varies by region, by historical period. Um, you start to see a difference in the Western coast of Puerto Rico, like Maya way post Haitian revolution and the dissolution of uh, slavery in Haiti, when like uh, plantation owners are like moving because they're scared of, of revolution. A lot of them come to Puerto Rico and they bring with them their attitudes, but also like the enslaved folks who were on their plantations to the Western coast. And you start to see um, this particular rhythm, Olambe in Bomba, be influenced and very similar to the rhythms found in the French Caribbean, um, very similar to Woka, elements of Bele as well. So you see the Caribbean in Bomba. And I think for me, that's the biggest takeaway of like how we come to understand it now, because it's pushing Puerto Rico into this black intellectual genealogy and geography that I think the United States has tried to separate from. But Bomba for me, it's, it's a lot of things. I'm sure we'll get into it, but on the basis, it's elements of a drummer, the dancer, the circle, uh, the singer as well, who is the timekeeper. Um, they hold a maraca, which helps with the marking of time. And then the songs, they vary and the rhythms vary. Each rhythm in bomba has a different mood or as I call in my own research, emotional expectation. Um, so like a yuba might be a little bit sadder. A holande, like I mentioned before, it's more like upbeat, happier rhythm, joyous rhythm. Um, a cuembe is more like flirty, seductive. So there's different ones. I would also say that um, each rhythm has its own vocabulary of movement. So there are some movements that you could do like across the rhythms, but for the most part, there are certain movements you wouldn't do to a yuba that you would do in a holande. And like the base movement, for walking around or getting around the bate and into the bate is different. So those are kind of like, I would say the Nelson Bolt of Bomba. To the earlier point you made on Bomba's decolonial, right? I think there's, um, at least from my very limited research, a very integral history of Bomba as an act of rebellion, um, particularly for those who were enslaved. So could you talk about how Bumba was used in its earlier forms in that, you know, sort of 18, 1700, 1800s aspect as you were talking about, and then th take us through how it sort of evolved? So Bumba, which I realized in like my classes, if you wanted to see resistance or rebellion by enslaved people, a lot of the time in Puerto Rican history, Bumba was going to be somewhere nearby. And because of that, um, Bomba was policed. There were slave codes that literally policed Bomba in the ways that it said, like, you can't play Bomba any other day but Sunday. You uh, couldn't mix, like, uh, statuses. So, like, perhaps um, there was a family where some of them might have been freed people and other folks enslaved, whereas Bomba used to be a space where all of them could be together. Uh, some plantations didn't allow for the mixing of statuses, whether family or not. But for the most part, in my own like findings, bomba is typically used as an excuse or a distraction. So folks would tell 
the plantation owners and like the overseers, like, oh, we're gonna practice for the bomba on Sunday or uh, we're gonna do bomba. And during that time, folks would plot and they're supposed to be practicing on like where they're gonna run, how they're gonna run. Um, or they would actually like set fire to plantations or they would run like during the bombazo, as we call it now, back then it was like Bala de Bomba, but from what I found is that the bombazo is like a space where insurgent attitudes <laughs> are nearby. <laughs> and I think that um, that is why Bomba has always been threatening to white supremacy in Puerto Rico and the United States, because like a lot of other genres in the Caribbean, drums represented something untranslatable, something beckoning to a time before enslavement. And for a lot of folks, if you could remember before, that's threatening, that's, that's not good. And so um, as I come to see the continuities and relationships between this like historic rebellion with Bomba into today, you know, it shifts and adapts in order to survive. There's a time when Bomba was policed in a different way through noise ordinances, uh, where you had to apply for permits to have them in your courtyard or in your marquesina, as like Puerto Ricans call the patio outside of, you know, like the covered patio in the Caribbean. So the marquesina, um, and you would have to like, you know, pay. And we're talking about Black Puerto Ricans who are low, I wouldn't even call them low income, like they're poor and they are trying to just get together with their families, with their friends, have a good time. And so we start to see different strategies to make sure that the genre continues and the tradition continues. So one of my mentors, Melanie Maldonado, she organizes the Bomba Research Conference every other year. And in 2019, we restored a bate of Domingo Negron in Cataño. And the bate had been like basically destroyed during Hurricane Maria. Like bates where everybody used to come. And he would, back in like the mid 19, early 1900s, he would hang a blue panuelo or like scarf or flag basically out on the front of his like gate to tell the neighborhood and to tell anybody walking by that like, we'll be having bomba this weekend. And so people would come from like two or three hours away. They'd have to take the ferry to come, but they would come. And I think that's one of the strategies and ways that we see Black folks rebel in Puerto Rico. And then most recently, I would say during the ousting of the Puerto Rican governor, former governor, I should say, um, Ricardo Rosellon, you see Bomba in front of Fortaleza, which is the governor's mansion. And you, you see people calling for his resignation and you again see Bomba again like in the wake of like the murder of George Floyd in Puerto Rico and then also in the states people are doing Bomba in solidarity to resist like police violence too and so I think there's there's always been this like championing of resistance next to Bomba and I agree with that wholeheartedly. I just think that surviving sometimes is resistance. So we also see Bomba change. Like the skirts that we see now, they're a little bit more folkloric because when the United States was trying to like kind of have a more, let's say hand in Puerto Rico, they needed to also not wipe away Puerto Rican culture, but sanitize it in a way. And you begin to see that the skirt resembles like flamenco dancing. Some of the stylings resemble flamenco. And that's because a band bomba had to adapt to survive. But that doesn't take away, I think, from the tradition bearers working to keep it alive. Um, because bomba was a very family-based practice. Like if your family danced bomba, or played bomba or went to these bombasos, then you probably grew up around it. And if you didn't, you had to be invited and learn from some elder who would take the time to teach you because most people were there throughout their childhood learning. So 
you begin to see that there's a certain type of pedagogy within the Bate as well. And I think um, one of those things you're taught is definitely how to endure and resist. I'm always so, I mean, it's not even amazed at this point because when you look at the critical histories of all of our musics, right? Whether it's the slave codes, but just the way that our states, and I use states because that obviously at this point, um, many of our islands were still colonized, but the way that the governments have literally and historically like were threatened by movement, right? It would it seems sort of like not laughable in a sense, but I think that's one thing that I've always tied um, across our various genres. It's like there was so much power in our ability to move, to dance, to create music, to drum that, you know, it was scary, right? Like it was scary. It was a threat to these colonial impositions to have us congregate in a way that, you know, what might at one point seem as though, you know, a group of people drumming can then later turn into a slave rebellion, for example, right? And I think these are sometimes the really critical points of our history that we're sometimes missing now that we think back from the 20th, 21st century, rather. I mean, in terms of Puerto Rico, right? I think oftentimes people immediately go to thinking of reggaeton when they think of music, right? Um, so could you talk a little bit more about how Bamba has not only like shaped Puerto Rican culture, but how it has also inspired other genres of music? Sure. Petra, her last name is going to escape me and that's going to be okay because I'm going to push it on, but it's called remixing the reggaeton. She has a whole chapter on like the similarities between Bomba and reggaeton. So like even through the policing of like sound ordinances and deeming it unworthy, like, I mean, back in like post-occupation of Puerto Rico, we start seeing hygiene bulletins from doctors saying that like, if you attend these dances, you're gonna get venereal diseases. Sudden movements are gonna lead to amputation and carpal tunnel and arthritis, like do danza. That's literally, they were championing like waltz type dancing, okay? Like the the anti blackness was just jumping out everywhere, and I think when reggaeton started happening, um, there were anti perreo ordinances out by governors, right? Um, you start to see some more policing in that way. But what I think to be most interesting is that uh, one of the OGs of reggaeton, Diego Calderon, in his like project forget which one I bought it there I think I'm pretty sure he has interludes of bomba in it and I think that speaks to like the continuities and the fact that like black Puerto Ricans remember that bomba was there before reggaeton that bomba really paved the way for reggaeton and for them and for them to be in that space to be in Puerto Rico when reggaeton was coming into realization and I think that that's like the most important thing because I, I also teach classes on reggaeton and for me it's always about like how are people surviving and how are people being seen and how are people being heard and in a colony right where everything is trying to kill you it could feel like that you living is just like an act against the genocidal inclination of colonialism these spaces the bate the dance floor, the house party, the underground where reggaeton is played, these are places of life, of Black life. And that those moments are enough to make you deal with the everyday bullshit, which is like the everyday attack on your personhood. And so I think that's the biggest thing. But I think a lot of people don't know what bomba is, at least when I was beginning my inquiry, you could call it, into bomba. But bomba has been around forever. But since Hurricane Maria, there's been an even more people practicing bomba, and it's on a larger stage with social media, I would say. And that is why I think that now people might think of Puerto Rican music and be like, oh, salsa, reggaeton, um, bomba. I don't think the leap is too far now, but maybe five years ago, it wasn't like that. Like six years ago, it wasn't like that. 
And I think uh, more people had to know. But a lot of people also are confused about what Bomba is, to be honest. Like, they're like, oh, it's that one dance with the skirt and the drums. And they don't really know the intricacies of it. Um, or they'll be like, oh, one by Plana. Like, they're the same genres and they're not. But I don't think that's something to be mad about. I think it's something to, like, educate people about. But as far as, like, reggaeton and, like, the progression into reggaeton, I think it's the same places, like, Luisa and Carolina that have high Black Puerto Rican population that then go into, like, being, not Luisa so much, but, like, Carolina for sure, being hot, hot spots for, like, reggaeton. And then you begin to see even more, like, metro area like by Almond, all types of different municipals and that makes perfect sense because it's like when you're thinking of Loisa um in a lot of the other cities when you're thinking of Bomba's history it makes sense that it was you know vibrant in these major pockets of black life it's yet another way we can use music to map our history um, one very important thing that I think, especially people who are really wanting to learn about Bumba from this episode, thinking about it, particularly for the 20th century, it's that the fact that Bumba's legacy is really tied to a group of families in a sense, right? So could you tell us a bit about these families and how Bumba has um, continued to evolve since their major holding of the genre? Yeah, I think that there are a few families that have continued Bomba's legacy. One of the main families I think that like demonstrate how Bomba like continues to survive in their pedagogy and in their like business, like the need to survive, to be a culture worker is also to be able to navigate capitalism sometimes. And you begin to see their family creating this um, a thread Cangrejero, which is like a network, right, of their schools. So now they have schools in Orlando, they have schools in California, uh, they got schools in different parts of Puerto Rico, and like they are one of the cornerstones of Bomba. Nobody can say they aren't, you know. Uh, but also, I think that beyond what they represent in Bomba, I think a lot about what it means to see them teaching their kids Bomba and like how they also talk about Bomba within their family. Like in one of my interviews, one sister was talking about how she lives away from her, her mom and her other sisters and how even though she talks to her sisters and mom like every day, she could come to Puerto Rico and enter the bate or see the bate, see her sister dancing or her mom dancing and see that like there's something there that she didn't know was happening see them working through things and for me it's like it must be beautiful to share that type of tradition with your family and be able to be closer to them on an even more intimate level right and know that like you're a part of this legacy of like enduring in a space where it's so hard to continue in the wake of like environmental catastrophe you talk about slavery you're talking about occupation that's what I think of families for the most part I wish that more people who wrote about Bomba and talk about them could talk about them as people a little bit more and like respect how it must be hard to feel like you have a whole bunch of weight on your shoulder to keep it going and like yeah that's, of course there's pride you know but also that like that's a righteous type of mission I feel like well we await the book drop I'm going to manifest it for you <laughs> Right. I'm excited for it. I'm excited for it. So everyone knows here at Strictly Facts, I am the biggest music nerd and we can't have um, an episode talking about the history of Bumba without you giving us your key favorite songs, performances, artists, um, videos, whatever it is that we have to check out after listening to this episode. So hit us with some of your favorite examples of Bumba in popular culture. Okay, popular culture. So I already talked about these interludes on Diego Calderon's um, Abarve project, but also Cancion Sin Miedo is a song out on Spotify and on YouTube. I personally suggest the YouTube because it's a great visual of like everyone coming together on this older sugar plantation um, and they're dancing to like a yuba. 
and it's by Barrialeras del Ocho de Mayo, I think, which is like the National Day of Violence Against Women, like international like day of violence against women. And uh, this collective meets every year and they do demonstrations. And one of the like organizers is one of my teachers uh, from Tayyip Bambuye, who's also on Apple Music and Spotify with some bomba stuff, but also on YouTube. That's where you're gonna find the gold, okay? Um, you're gonna find Asuba, an all women group. They got some good, good, good um, songs that speak out against domestic violence as well as Puerto Rican colonialism, like in the wake of Hurricane Maria. Also, Buya is on SoundCloud and you can find videos on YouTube as well. Like they're from Chicago, but they have a Southern sound, Southern roots from Guayama, Ponce in their group. And they're very much, I would say, a vibe. So those are my faves. Canción Sin Miedo. Blena Combativa has a few, like a little bit of Boma, but they're mostly Blena. Um, and then Asuba and Buya. Those are my faves. Oyago, stay tuned for Strictly Fact Sounds, where we connect our history to pop culture. Being that Bomba is both a music and a dance, we had to pair Dr. Bruno's sonic recommendations with some readings and a video or two. Articles, Suelta el Monio, The Histories of Change Agents and Perpetrators of Bomba Culture by Melanie Maldonado, and Corporal Sounding, Listening to Bomba Dance, Listening to Puerto Rican Exes by Jade Power Sotomayor, trace the histories of gender, dance, and movement as critical to understanding Bomba's history. There are also a few videos we linked, and they include the multi-part documentary, Ayers de la Bomba by Jerry Ferrao, and a two-part selection by KQED Arts' If Cities Could Dance series on YouTube, entitled Puerto Rico's Bomba, A Dance of the African Diaspora, and the Bomba Dance Tutorial with Afro-Puerto Rican dancer Mar Cruz. Check them out and let us know what you learned from this episode. Thank you so much, Dr. Bruno, for joining us for such an enlightening conversation on the history of Bomba in Puerto Rico. And as always, listeners, thank you for participating. Links to Dr. Bruno's work will be in our show notes, and we hope you enjoyed this episode. Look more, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Strictly Facts. Visit strictlyfactspodcast.com for more information from each episode. Follow us at Strictly Facts Pod on Instagram and Facebook and at Strictly Facts PD on Twitter.